It is so good to see everybody today. You are looking fantastic. Hey, I want to take a moment and welcome those of you who are watching online, one of our campuses. We are glad that you are here with us today. Come on, put your hands together. Welcome them in today. So excited. Amen. And as you came in today, uh, you noticed probably every location uh, in the four-year areas, uh, in, the, in the areas around the auditoriums and sanctuaries, there are, are groups uh, that are set up and re- ready to receive you, connect with you today. And I'm going to tell you something. I just want to encourage you. It's our, it's our launch of our fall group sort of season. I want to encourage you to get involved in a group, get connected in a relationship. I, I, listen, I'll tell you, there's, there's nothing more powerful than being in a life-giving God-centered sort of faith-building relationship where you're building community, where you're growing in freedom and connection. And I think especially as it relates today, the message that we're going to be talking about, I think it's important because it really is a place for you to utilize and practice using your gifts. You know, the Bible is filled with one another. So there's 60 some alone in the New Testament it talks about how we live, love, pray, you know, encourage one another. And we do that through our groups. And so I want to encourage you, if you're new to Zion City, get in a group. If you're, you, yeah, I should say if you're old to Zion City, get in a group as well. I don't care where you are, get in a group. Amen. Well, this morning, we're going to continue in our series on 1 Corinthians. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to 1 Corinthians. And we're going to start in chapter 12. And um, uh, to give you just a little bit of a, a context today, we are actually going to be dealing with three chapters today. Um, and it's not because I'm trying to hurry things along. It's actually because this is a, a prominent theme that Paul started addressing with the Corinthian church. And it was actually the thing of, theme of spiritual gifts, but but really focusing in on the gift of tongues and spiritual language. And I know for some of you today, as you enter in, you might be thinking, oh no, I, I, walked in, I didn't walk into one of those places, and I'm, I'm sorry to say you did. You walked into one of those places. Actually, I'm not sorry to say you did. Unapologetically, I'd say you did, because we believe in the gifts of the Spirit active and present in the body of Christ today. Amen. And so I, I just want to help you. Now, here's the problem that I see is that most of what we have seen about spiritual gifts, you know, we often see depicted in Hollywood or depicted in movies or TV. When you see somebody who is um, Pentecostal, charismatic, they're usually, you know, sort of portrayed as this crazy nut job, you know, weirdo, you know, they've got 15 dogs under their front porch. It's all, it's just weird, right? And I tell you, that's the problem is that most of what we've seen, it's interesting, it's always depicted that if you believe in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, then automatically you're weird. And uh, I like to just think that we, we love to do, you know, be a part of what the Holy Spirit is doing and flow with the Holy Spirit. But listen, if you meet somebody who's weird and flowing in the Spirit, they're probably weird without the Spirit. They're just weird, okay? And, and you know, I think that's, that's all good. It's all okay, because weird is a very subjective thing that's based off different opinions. But I just want to say this. Today, we're going to jump into, and I think what Paul's word for, for us today is so encouraging, is so powerful uh, as it relates to spiritual gifts. And so we're going to jump into it. The Corinthians were a group of people that had come out of paganism and idol worship and all of these different backgrounds. And um, they had become really, I guess, obsessed with the idea of speaking in tongues. And um, they had become so obsessed that the use of tongues had actually become the abuse of tongues. And so Paul is now writing them to address some abuses. Now, here's what I would say. Most of us, when we've seen things that are uh, abusive, I don't mean physically or that sort of thing. I'm just saying it's an abuse of a spiritual gift. What we typically tend to do is just sort of wrap the whole thing up and push it away and just go, well, I don't want to be weird. I don't want that abuse. And, and truthfully, what Paul shows us is anywhere there is a gift, there can be an abuse. And so we have to, we have to steward even the gifts that God's given us as well. And so they had become enamored with the idea of speaking in tongues, so much so um, that they were getting together and all everybody wanted to do was speak in tongues. And what they believed was their spiritual language, they actually, that's why Paul refers to it as the tongue of men and angels in one point, they're actually addressing this as though it was some sort of spiritual gift that made them more spiritual in nature. And Paul starts combating this idea and starting to help them understand the real use of these gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. And so verse one, if you're there, uh, we're going to read together. And it says this, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, 
I do not want you to be uninformed. Now, let me just pause. Anytime Paul says that, it's because they are uninformed. (laughs) He's literally saying this. I'm about to draw attention to an area um, in which you have some, some misinformation or lack of information. He says, you know that when you were pagan, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. He says, you were swept up and brought into this. You were ecstatic about your worship of these idols. He says, therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaks in the spirit of, no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. And so I I think what Paul gives us here, um, just as a side note, is is the sort of criterion on which we are to sort of judge, you know, the body of believers. And it is specifically related to how, how do you perceive and how you, do you relate to Jesus Christ? Um, he's saying this, you know, there are, there are a lot of people who today would say, well, you know, I like Jesus and I like Buddha and I like new age and like this, and like that, like this, like this. That's not what Paul's saying. What Paul is saying is, what do you believe about Jesus? Because when you, when you believe that Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life, when you believe that he is the, he is God become man, died upon the cross, lived a sinless life, was risen from the dead and is ascended to the right hand of the father and is coming back for his church. When you believe that about Jesus, then you can't believe believe that except the Holy Spirit is worked in you and is drawing you. So a great criterion, so to speak, to judge a a sort of ministry or or maybe not a person, I don't mean judgmental, I mean just to make a decision is what do you believe about Jesus? Because that will tell you what a, what a, where a person is very specifically, not Jesus and, but just simply Jesus. And so Paul says, you know, no one can say that except the Holy Spirit is working in them. Now, verse four, he says, there are a variety of gifts but the same spirit. You might want to underline that. A variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but the same God who empowers them all. To each one, to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Now, what Paul says is this, and it's really my first point in, in this morning, and that is this. Paul says, every believer has been given spiritual gifts. So if you're here, a person here today and you say, I've surrendered my life to Jesus, I'm following Jesus, and maybe that's a week ago or it's 10 years ago or 20 years ago, there is something that is common amongst us besides following Jesus, and that is you have been given a spiritual gift. Every believer, it says one spirit who has apportioned gifts to believers, and he has given gifts to all believers for the common good. Somebody say the common good. Now, this is what is so interesting. Um is that he gives our gifts not just for our own. Remember, he's combating Corinthians who are using their gifts to show how spiritual they are. He says, no, 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 your gift is not for you. Your gift is actually for the common good. It is to help each other. It is is to be used in a way that you build up the body of Christ, that you you are using your gift to contribute. The word that he uses here is the word symphaeo. Which is interesting, our word today is derived from it, the word symphony. I want you to think about a symphony. Our our word symphony is derived from this concept of symphio. Symphony, what's a symphony? A symphony, if you've ever been to a a symphony, it is a gathering of probably, you know, uh, expert musicians, perhaps. Um, I say, unless you go to the sixth sixth grade band concert, come on somebody, right? I'm, there's some sounds that come out of those sixth graders I didn't know existed. I mean, I, sometimes I'm like, I think that's what the gates of hell will sound like, all of that squeaking and screaming and moaning, and that's just the sixth grade class. Anyways, but the reality is, I joke, but the, the reality is this, he says, this idea of the symphony. What's a symphony? A symphony is a gathering of musicians who come together, and each one plays their part that has been, that has been developed for them. And so whatever their instrument is, they bring their gift to the symphony and they begin to play their part. Now, there might be multiple flutists and multiple violinists and multiple percussionists and just depending on the size of the symphony. Some are smaller, some are larger. But every, every musician shows up to play their part and to contribute. Are y'all getting this? And so the, the reality is this, you know, you don't go to the symphony to watch the conductor. As a matter of fact, his back to, is to you the majority of the time. And can I tell you what a great picture of the church today. Maybe I should just preach like this. This would be the best. 
That's my better side anyways, right? Like, like the backside, right? But the reality is this, is that, is that you don't go to a symphony simply to watch the conductor. He, he's there flailing his arms. But the whole point is, is you are watching and listening every person contribute to the beauty of the moment, the beauty of the song that's being played. Now, here's the thing about the symphony. If there are people who refuse to play, then their part is missing. Imagine a symphony of, oh, say, a thousand people, and only three people show up with instruments to play. Only 20, 50, 100. It's not going to have near the impact and the effect if every member of the, and every one of them has a unique play. Listen, the, the flutist is not playing the violin part. The violin part is not playing the tuba part. The tuba part's not playing the percussion. Why? Because each one of them have a, have a plan and a design and a part to play to contribute to the overall beauty of the symphony. And this is what Paul is teaching us. He shows us the, the picture of a body. He shows us the picture of a bride. But he shows us that we are all called to use our gifts to contribute for the common good and to build up. Here's my question for you. If you were to take a test today and there's one question, here's the question. How are you contributing? <laughs> I hear a lot of murmurs. They're like, <laughs> don't ask that question. Right. Because we, we don't approach the church from this mindset of we're coming. Here, I'll just show you this way. A lot of times when I meet people who are leaving a church and perhaps they're coming to, to Zion City and, or perhaps they're leaving Zion City, they'll say something like this. Well, I just wasn't being, I wasn't being fed. I wasn't being fed. And I would say to you, my job is not to feed you. My job is to equip you. My job is not to feed you. You have your Bible. You have the spirit of God. You have the presence of God. Worship. You have everything available that you need to be fed and to grow in your spiritual walk. Now, that doesn't diminish the importance of the church, but the importance of the church is there's a different role. And the role that I have is to equip the saints for acts of righteousness until we come to such a place in the, in, of unity and such a place of maturity in Ephesians chapter four. We get the mind of Christ. We, have the, we start to behave like Christ because we are equipped to use our gifts to build to, for the common good and to contribute to the body of Christ. This is, and this is not just me in a soapbox, but this is why this concept of, of just digital church outside of gathering just doesn't fulfill the scriptures. And I'm not being judgmental. I understand for some it's a resource. That's what it's meant to be, a resource. If you're sick, you're traveling, you're unable, you know, you're, you're, you know I would even say while you're looking, you, you've moved and transitioned and all that. That's all great. But here's the problem. You can't sit in your living room in your pajamas and use your spiritual gift effectively in the body of Christ. Amen. Our viewership just went way down. So be it. Because the reality is this, the body of Christ was never predicated on you coming in to watch the conductor. It was predicated on you coming and playing your part, being equipped. And I don't say that with condemnation and judgment. I really am not. I just want to I, I awaken something into you with the help of the Holy Spirit that you go, you know what? I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Jesus. Paul says this, the Holy Spirit gives gifts to every believer. He apportions gifts to each one individually as he wills. He gives you the gift that you need. Now, here's the question that always comes up. Well, which one? If I'm going to have a gift, I want to have the best gift, right? I want to have the best gift. What's the best gift? Give me the best gift, right? And this is part of the problem is because we're like, man... In the symphony, we're watching the percussionists be like, those guys are so cool, I wish I could be them. We're comparing our gifts to each other, but let me tell you what the best gift is. Are you ready? Write it down, the best gift. The best gift is the gift that the Holy Spirit gives you in that moment that helps and builds up the body. That's the best gift. So sometimes the best gift is not always preaching. Amen. Sometimes the best gift is, is, is not what we think is, Paul actually addresses this because he now starts to talk about we're a body. He says there's heads, there's feet, there's ears, there's eyes, there's hands, there's, there's all these different parts. And we would never think to ourselves, well, because you're not the head, you're not important because we need every part of the body functioning together to be the body. Any part of the body that is missing becomes this, 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 
We, we would call it a disability. We would call it a lack. Any part of that's missing, it causes the body, the body not to be able to function to its full capacity as it was designed to. And so what happens is we have to work around what's missing. Amen. And so we are busy trying to compare my gift to their, well, I can't sing like them. Well, I can't preach. I can't teach like them. Well, I can't. But listen, that, that, listen, if God's not giving you that gift, number one, you don't want to do it. Number two, if you've not got a grace for it, you don't want to do it. So why don't you find and discover the gift that God's given you, the grace he's given you, and begin to operate it? Because when you operate in your spiritual gift, here's what happens. When I operate my spiritual gift, I go home energized. I don't go home tired. I go home like, man, every day ought to be like that day. This was an amazing, can we do the same thing tomorrow? And what happens is my spiritual gift works. Some of you are so frustrated in what you're doing because you're not in your spiritual gift. You're trying to do something you were never designed to do. And because you weren't designed to do it, it's not effective. This is how you will know a spiritual gift is a spiritual gift. It always works. See, if I meet somebody who's, who's struggling and they're in despair and they're broken and they're, and, and, they're, and they're just dealing with doubt and fear and anxiety, listen they, listen, they may appreciate a gift of teaching, but they may not need a gift of teaching right then. Well, you know, this is what we do. Well, you know what the Bible says. Blah, blah, blah. And listen, I'm, I'm for the Bible, trust me. Um, I'm for good sound doctrine and teaching. But what that person might need is an encourager. They might need an exhorter. They might need someone with the gift of compassion and mercy to come along and say, you know, I just want you to know I'm going to climb into the well. I'm going to sit here with you for a while. We're not going to live here forever, but we're going, to, we're going to go through the grieving process. We're going to go through the suffering process. We're going to go through the pain process and just be okay with it. Know that God's given us everything that we need to overcome. But I'm just going to, I'm going to climb into the well. I'm not just trying to get you out of the well. I'm going to climb into the well and just sit with you for a season and just be here and use my gift to bring comfort to you. You see, the truth is this, your gift, this is what you need to know, your gift is your lens. Gift is how you see things. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are times you can walk in, some of you are, are new to Zion City or newer, or maybe this is your first Sunday. And uh, there's times we can walk into a church, especially because many of us, this is becoming more and more uncommon, but many of us have all kinds of sort of history with the church world. And so we have, we come in with biases and we come with perspectives and, and that's all good. Everybody has a bias. Okay. But we come into a church and all too often we come into the church, we start looking around going, well, you know, I like this, but I don't really like that. I don't care for that. Right? I mean, I like the church. I like the worship. I like the I like the, and, and I would just say this, I'm just gonna, let's just, let me just kind of talk for a second. Which this is always very dangerous, by the way. So um, when I start talking, that's where, I get off script, that's where it's really dangerous, okay? See, it's clear about Zion City, people love the weekend experience in the gathering. And because you look around, every service is just this, okay, it's just full, right? Campuses, that sort of thing. And, and, if, and if we're not careful, we'll think, well, this is, this is it. This is, I go because I like that piece of it. But yet we don't contribute, and so then I come along and go, hey, you need to get in a group. 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 Get 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 a group. And, and you sit out there and go, ha, ha, cute pastor. I ain't doing that. That's so cute of you. I ain't doing that. And here I am trying to equip you for freedom and equip you for relationship and equip you for when life happens, because I know life will happen. You got kids. You're married. You're single. You know, you're alive. Life will happen. And you're going to need people in your life. Maybe you don't need them right now, but you will need them. And, and by the way, maybe you don't need them, but maybe they need you. And so I'll say something like this, like, hey, let's get in a group, let's get in a group, let's get in a group. And that's why we have a passion for more people to be in groups than even come on the weekends. Because let me tell you what that means. That means it's evangelistic in nature. That's you're inviting people in your neighborhood. People you were, hey, you should come over to my house. We're having a barbecue. We're hanging out together. You don't have to be like, we're, we're studying through the book of, you know, first, you know, eschatologies and 505. No, no, you don't have to do that. I guess you can if that's what you're studying. There is no such thing, by the way. But, but the reality is, the reality is, is, is that the danger is we start thinking like, well, I just, I just do this and I, I never play my part. I never contribute. I want you to hear that. I don't ever contribute. Here, here's my belief. Um, this has been really transparent. I don't know what's on me today, but um, I don't know if you'll last very long, if that's really your attitude. I've watched so many, we call it church churn. 
I see so many people come and go and come and go. And I think the number one reason is because they never connect and use their gift and they never build relationships. And so the reality is they're temporary. It may be a five year temporary, but it's temporary because you'll just, because it's just not enough. Y'all hearing me? And I say this as, your, as a caution to you. I don't, we don't need a bigger church. We don't. We, we don't. But we, need, we do need to equip the saints and we need to reach the lost. That's what we need to do. Amen. Amen. See, your gift is your lens. Here's why I say all this. Just bearing my heart to you, okay. Your gift is your lens. You come into church and you go, man, you know, you know, pastor, I hear all the good things this church does for the, the poor and for the needy and for the hungry and the clothing, but you know what? We need some, we need some Bible studies. We need some deep discipleship. We need to take people deeper in the word. We need to take people, and, and to that I go, amen, brother. Amen, sister. And the problem is this. You'll do one of two things with that. The, the one option was this is you'll, you'll uh, engage in the spiritual gift of criticism, which is not a spiritual gift, by the way. Well, you know, that church just didn't have that. And, and then you'll just leave. You'll go looking for a church that will fulfill your consumeristic desire. Did he just say that? Yes, I did. That's what we do. And if, they're, if, they're, if, they, if they check off most of the boxes and whatever. And, or you say, you'll realize that your gift which is probably discipleship or mentoring or, or, or walking discipleship, you know, that sort of thing with people, you realize that's my gift, that's my passion, and so I'm going to contribute to the body. Perhaps God has brought you here to bring something to this church that we currently do not have. Perhaps there is a missing part of the symphony for whatever reason that what he's looking for is some people who could come in and, and bring their gifting and their passion because they get up. Nobody has to get them out of bed in the morning to do this thing because they're passionate about it, because they love it, because they believe, man, it's the thing that changes everybody's life. And so perhaps it is your lens that God has given you. And so instead of becoming critical and going, well, they just don't have it. I got to go find a church who does. It's like, by, it's like joining a symphony and you play the trumpet and there are 87 trumpets in that, in that symphony. Well, we got the best brass section in the world. Well, you probably do. But the reality is, maybe that lens is why God has brought you here. You see, your spiritual gift is your lens. I, I, if you've ever been in a, uh, I remember this a lot in, in the camp days of youth ministry in the cafeteria. You ever been in the cafeteria and have someone drop their tray? The first thing everybody does when somebody drops their tray is spin around to look shamefully upon whoever did it, right? And we look at them, first of all, we're a little scared, and then we look over and like, ah, oh, and we see this problem happen. And, and unfortunately, in many instances, what happens in the church world is we just go back to what we were doing, right? But, but some people allow their lens to move them into action. What do they do? Well, what happens is that person is kind of standing there and they're embarrassed because everybody's looking at them and making a big you know, ruckus over it and they're, and they're trying to clean it up or, or maybe they're running away. But what inevitably happens is somebody shows up perhaps that has a gift of mercy or a gift of compassion and they walk up and put their arm around them and say, hey, you know, it's okay. I've done the same thing. I've dropped my tray before. You're probably embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed. It's okay. It happens to all of us. And they bring comfort and salve to that person who is feeling, they stand with somebody while they're feeling embarrassed. And then what happens is somebody comes along with maybe a, just this heart of a servant and a gift of serving and their, their acts of service. And so they come and they just start cleaning. No, 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 I got it. It's just and, and this person's embarrassed. And no, no, I got it. I'll clean it up for you. And they start picking things up. And, and then what happens is somebody shows up who has maybe a gift of administration or a gift of leadership. And they go, hey, um, somebody, somebody grab a mop over there. Yeah, go ahead and bring the mop over here. And, and you over here, why don't you, why don't you grab them a new tray? They're going to need to eat. And, they'll, they'll, and so th this gift of administration and leadership shows up and starts making things right. It starts fixing the situation. And, and then all of a sudden, the, the, there's the, the teacher who shows up. And the teacher walks up and says, you know, I was watching you carry your tray. <laughs> and I noticed that you had two full glasses of chocolate milk over here. And if you would have split those glasses in, instead of putting them on the same side, on this side, then the reality, you, you know that the word, um, the word chocolate comes from the, the Greek word chocolate, right? <laughs> right? 
And you're like, I don't know what that has to do with anything, but okay. <laughs> and so the teacher thinks you need to know everything. That's why you're in church 45 minutes to an hour of me preaching, because I'm going to make sure you know it, right? You're like, I don't know what that has to do with anything, but okay. like I was noticing if you had put it this way, then you probably wouldn't have dropped your tray and you probably would have been, so you'd have made it, you'd have, you would have spared you all this embarrassment. And the teacher wants to teach you all this stuff. Then there comes along the, the prophetic exhorter. You know, I was just uh, over there in my prayer table in my closet over in the corner. And I felt the Lord send me to you right now, right? Here they come. And I just want to tell you, you know, you may have dropped your tray, but God's not done with you yet. Lunch is not over. Hup. All right. I wish I had a hanky, but like, like, I just want to tell you right now, God's not done with you and you may feel like you failed and you've fallen apart. God has double dessert for you if you just, right? <laughs> and it's everybody's lens. You show up with your gift. Not any of them are wrong. Actually, all of them can be somewhat helpful. Now there are better gifts. Why are the better gifts? They're the ones that actually help. Right? Maybe you don't need to know the Greek word for chocolate, but, but the reality is the better gift is the gift that helps. The gift that does something in you. The gift that works. Are y'all hearing me? And so, and so Paul calls them and says, every believer has been given a spiritual gift. Now I need to say to you, chapters 12 through 14, as we begin to shift, because Paul's about to shift, he begins to talk about a very specific gift and it's the gift of tongues. Now, I find this very interesting because in my experience, there is no other gift that seems to be, I don't know why it is, I, I have ideas, but that it's so polarizing as the gift of tongues. Because if I say to people, um, you know, hey, I just, we're just gonna believe in faith for your healing, people are like, I got no problem with faith. You know, I'm gonna pray for your healing. I, I used to go to a, a primarily cessationist school in high school who did not believe in any of the, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and active, active you know, placement of today. And yet every other class would start out with them going, does anybody have a prayer request? Yeah, can you pray for my grandma? She needs to be healed. And I'm just like, I am so confused because I thought you didn't believe in this, right? And then every, you know, some of you will know this, like every experience I've had, you know, like you got, anybody else have a prayer request? Yeah, um, unspoken. I'm like, why'd you even say that? Like, it was unspoken. Just leave it unspoken. I don't even know what to pray for, right? But that's my pet peeve. Anyway, so, <clears throat> so, so I would go, and, and, but there's nothing more polarizing. They would talk about healing, pray for healing, and I'm going, but wait, don't you, you don't believe in this. So I'm so confused by this. But there is, seems to be one gift, and the gift of spiritual language or tongues. I'll use that word interchangeably. Um, that is so polarizing. And I have to wonder, why is that? Why is that the thing? Is it because we've seen abuses and, and because we've seen it? Is it just simply because we don't understand and what we don't understand we avoid? Is it because we're afraid of looking weird? Right? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what it is. It could be a number of reasons, but Paul begins to change his focus and talk about general spiritual gifts and the body being together and how we stand together and how we need each other and how we must all contribute and how we rejoice when someone rejoices and we mourn when somebody mourns. And then in verse 27, he says this, now you're all the body of Christ, individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administration, and there it is again, various kinds of tongues. Now, I believe why Paul, is, he, he lists a, a number of lists of spiritual gifts. And so there's a couple things we can learn from this. Number one, there's not any one list that is an all comprehensive, inclusive list of gifts. Because if you go into Romans, it talks about a gift of leadership, a gift of hospitality, a gift of faith, a gift of teaching. And so there are many more gifts than he just lists, but he's just really specifically focusing here, and you know why, every list he lists here, he ends with tongues. So he, he's, he's dealing with contextually where they are at, and he keeps coming back to this tongues and spiritual language thing, and, and he, he keeps coming back now, and he says, now, now, first God placed the apostles and the prophets and the teachers. Let me say something. I believe Ephesians 4 speaks about the offices, the gifts of Jesus to the church, the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, teacher, and the evangelist. But I think what Paul is talking about here is not just the office, but the ministry of these offices as well. So what am I saying? 
I believe every, every person sitting in this room has a ministry of apostolic ministry because the apostolic means you are a sent one. Okay? Do I think everybody's an apostle? No, I don't. If, if we don't you know, use nouns like you're an apostle, we don't do that. But, but I do believe in an apostolic ministry, the sent ones, right? The spiritual fathers. Are y'all with me? And so there are, there are prophetic people in this room. There are teachers in this room. All I want you to understand is this. You don't have to have an office to function in the ministry. Now, where does this really show up? In the office of pastor. Because while I might be the pastor, the reality is the majority of you are probably closely pastored by other people that function in that ministry. Does that make sense? This is what groups is all about, is you getting in relationship. And it's not that the group leader is like, oh, they're, they're the pastor. No, no, no. They are in the ministry of caring, feeding, tending, caring, protecting, loving the sheep. Doesn't mean I don't, it just means in a congregation this size that we have to have many pastors, not just staff people, but people who bring the ministry gift that God's given them that Paul talks about that the Holy Spirit gives people for the purpose of caring for people. Because we want every person who walks into Zion City, every campus to be known, to be seen, to be heard, to be cared for, and to be equipped. Amen. Amen. And so Paul lists this, this, this list out again, and again ends with tongues. And he says this. He says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do, do all work miracles, do all possess, possess the gift of healings? Do all speak in tongues? He says, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. I've already explained to you what the higher gift is. The higher gift is the one that's effective that the Holy Spirit gives you in that moment for ministry. That builds up people. Amen? But it seems like, and, and this is where the concept of spiritual gifts and what some would call, there's a, a doctrine called cessationism. And cessationism is, is the view that all miraculous signs, gifts, wonders, um, speaking in tongues, prophecy, healing, have all ceased with what they would call the apostolic age or at the last apostle, it died when the last apostle died. And so this is where some would say, well, see, the Bible says not everybody's going to speak in tongues. Now, here's what I would say to you. A couple thoughts I'm going to give you. Number one, um, you can't find the concept or the teaching of cessationism in the Bible. It doesn't teach it. What cessationism is, this belief it all stops, is a theo is, it's a theology. It's a doctrine that's been developed from an interpretation of Scripture. Are you all following me? I'm not trying to get nerdy on you. I just want you to understand for a second that, that John Calvin and, and others, Zwingli and different ones like that, all contributed to this idea of cessationism. Well, why did they do that? Why did they, why did they choose this? And here, here's, here's, my, here's my supposition. Here's my thought. Um, these men were all present in what we would call the Great Reformation, where, where Luther came and, and nailed his thesis on the church doors. And, and it, there was this concept of what they called sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. Sola Scriptura, only the Bible. Why? Because the Catholic Church had gotten farther and farther away from biblical doctrine and started creating doctrines um, that, were, that were really serving the church, not the traditions of men and serving the church, not really biblical. For instance, things like, like um, penance and, and buying indulgences. Think about this. I could pay money to take care of my sin. That's not even biblical. It's actually against what the Bible teaches us. Only Jesus, the shedding of blood, addresses our sin, brings forgiveness. And so what happened was at some point, now Luther comes up and becomes this champion along with Calvin and others, and they went to this, this pendulum swung from like the church has got all these abuses happening to scripture alone. And so what they tried to exclude is anything in their mind that wasn't just black and white. That means I can't let you tell me that the Spirit of God led you to do something because, because that would mean that some of these things could be right. So we're just cutting it all off. So it's kind of like they threw the baby out with the bathwater. Y'all with me? And so, and, and I understand, I understand, I, 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 I can't understand how someone in that position would, would swing the pendulum, well, bless God, we're just not doing anything else written in the Bible. But here's the problem with this. You, you even have John Calvin himself, who, again, I'm not down, because I think there are a lot of things that he added in terms of doctrine to the body of Christ, that, that he added some components. Not all of them, I don't agree with 
with Calvinism and its five, the two, I don't agree with all of that. There's some of it I can see. There's some of it I would have a different interpretation of. But here's what I want you to see. Even Calvin himself believed, here's what he believed, that the apostles, and you could find this um, in his book, uh, The Institutions, which is his major contribution to Christianity. Book four, by the way, if you're looking or if you have it on your shelf at home. Um, he says this, that apostles, prophets, and evangelists were temporary, but pastors and teachers are permanent. Now, here's the thing, like, if you're going to be integrous to scripture, you got to go, well, show me that. And you just can't. We said, well, because they all died off and we still need, what they would say is we still need pastors and teachers of the word, right? And that's the position they take. Now, here's, here's what John Calvin himself says in book four of the Institutes, in, Institutions. He says this, now and again, he acknowledges, the Lord revives them, meaning the apostolic and prophetic, as the, as the need of times demand. So he unwinds his own argument by saying it never happens. Well, sometimes it happens. Y'all with me? He says, I do not deny that the Lord has sometimes at a later point, John Calvin's words, at a later point, at a later period, raised up apostles or at least evangelists in their place as it has happened in our own day. So the number one sort of instigator of secessionism says, but yeah, it happens sometimes. In his own words, in his own books, in his own doctrinal books, he says this. And all I'm saying to you is this, I think there's a tendency sometimes to push away what we don't understand and just go, well, I'm just gonna read the Bible. And I'm, I am absolutely for you reading the Bible. And I will tell you this, anything that a person says the spirit of God, this is why Paul says if they say Jesus is accursed, it's not the spirit of God, it's something else. He gives you this, this practice and says, listen, anything that is given to you by the spirit or through a person who's probably, it's got to line up with this word. It's got to come under the authority of this word. So if this is why I say someone says, well, God told me I'm supposed to kill somebody. That's not God, that's another spirit because that contradicts his word. He says, thou shalt not murder. Right? And so when you understand that, you start understanding that, that, that it's not that you've got these two extremes, it's actually both together, the spirit and the word. And the word is the written revelation of God's heart and who God is, and the spirit of God is there available, because why? Because you need spiritual gifts for this life. That's the truth of it. You were never intended to walk your Christian walk to fulfill a list of rules and regulations and do's and don'ts without a supernatural empowerment and a grace, which is where we get our word charismata, charismatic grace, gift. He says, I've given you gifts for this life. I want you to operate in this life with spiritual gifts that are productive, that are effective, that bring fulfillment and that advance the church and the kingdom of God. And so, as we look at it, Paul continues to address this. And I think, let me go back to are all speaking tongues. So, you, you cannot really integrously take the whole idea of tongues and say, well, it's just, it's not supposed to be, it's not supposed to be there, because it's there. And I'm going to go further, because Paul actually goes further with it in just a few moments. But, some would say, well, okay, it's here, but it's not for everybody. You know, apparently God just chooses his favorites, <laughs> Right? God just chooses people who are, I don't know, more spiritual than me and lets them operate in these gifts. And to that, I would say, you're functioning much in the mindset of the Corinthians because they thought there were spiritual people and not spiritual people based off spiritual gifts. And Paul corrects that and says, no, 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 no. It's all about the spiritual gift you've been given that's for the common good, for helping the body, for building up the body, for building up the church, for contributing to the symphony that God has placed you in. Amen? And so what does he mean? Does everybody speak in tongues? Is everybody a prophet? Is everybody an apostle? Here's what I would say to you. If you look at the context, this is so key, the context of these chapters, Paul is talking about public worship. Everything he talks about, he talks about women speaking in church, public worship. He talks about spiritual gifts, public worship. Everything in context, 12, 13, 14, he's talking about when you gather together as the body, this is how it should operate. Now here's what I would say to you. Is everybody gonna preach this morning? Hopefully not, right? Because some of you, it's not your gift, and some of you think it's your gift, right? You know, we got 47 people. We're gonna start with this section. Y'all are you know, gonna bring your best, your highest and best, and just preach this to heaven, right? Well, the reality is, it, number one, capacity, time, capacity, you just it couldn't do it. It wouldn't work. And so Paul says this, 
in every church gathering, you're, you're coming to contribute the specific role that the Holy Spirit has brought you to bring. So can I tell you, the person sitting over there in kids' ministry, ministering to those children, creating a safe environment for them, and loving on them, and teaching them about Jesus, is just as important as what I'm doing right here? Can I tell you, I'm not just saying that. I'm saying that because I genuinely believe that. Someone has said, my gift is, is teaching or, or compassion or loving, and I have a passion for an age group, and I love to serve children, I love to pour into kids, and I love to youth ministry, I love it. Listen, according to scripture, the person sitting in the sound booth is just as important as I am. When we gather together, the person running the lights so that we can see, or not see as the case might be, like the, the person who's running the light, they are just as important. The person who stands at the door and greets somebody is just as important. The person who, the person who runs a group and ministers to, to women or ministers to men or ministers to, to teenagers is just as important. He says, we, we often, he says, we give a lot of glory and honor to the body, certain parts. He's like, but the truth is you actually should, we give more honor to the hidden things. I won't go into what all he's talking about, but think about what you hide. The most personal, intimate parts of your body, you hide, right? You don't hide your hand because it's just a normal old hand. You don't care if anybody sees your hand. Are y'all with me? And so he's actually saying we give, more, we give more honor and more credit to those things that are hidden than those things that are even. So he flips this whole mindset of what's really important. Are y'all following me? And so I just believe what Paul's saying is not everybody's going to speak in tongues and not everybody's going to interpret in a church setting. He actually gives some guidelines in a few moments. We'll get to it. Let's, let's keep moving. But, but, but I want you to see this. Paul then ends this portion and says this, and now I will show you still a, still a more excellent way. And so then he enters into what I call the, the, the ice cream sandwich of the love chapter. You got a cookie on one side, a cookie on the other, and some really good ice cream right in the middle. Come on, somebody. You ever have an ice cream sandwich? All right, we're giving away after service. No, we're not. But anyways, <laughs> I feel like we should at this point, right? But uh, the love chapter. Now, we've all heard the love chapter because you've been to a wedding, you've heard the love chapter. Love is patient, love is kind, right? And love doesn't listen to a word the pastor is saying when he's saying all that, right? Okay. And, and what I want you to understand is this. What Paul is simply saying is this. Paul, love is not a, is in contrast to spiritual gifts. It is the secret ingredient of spiritual gifts. Some people who believe in cessationism have said, well, I don't know about all that spiritual gift stuff. I'm just going to love people and feed the poor and just care for the, and, and again, that's great, but, but we, listen, you, you go with both. You don't go with one or the other. He says, actually, the key to spiritual gifts is you operating in a spirit of love. The problem with the Corinthians is they weren't operating in love. They were operating in selfish arrogance and focusing on their own spiritual gifts. He's like, how about you build each other up, love each other, care enough about each other that when you come to church, you contribute and you're gracious and you're kind and you're loving and you use your gift and you make space for them to use their gift as well. Now, he says some important things, though, about spiritual gifts in the love chapter. He says this, as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. And as for knowledge, it will pass away. This is primarily for the cessationists, the, the foundational scripture they would use. See, well, the Bible says it's all going to stop. And I agree with Paul, it is all going to stop. The question is when. I don't disagree with Paul. It is all going to, there's going to be a point that you don't need prophecy and you don't need you don't need tongues and you don't need knowledge. But when is that? Well, here's my question to you. So again, let's go back to the concept. If you're gonna, if you're gonna I believe it's all stopped, you gotta believe it's all stopped. And here's my question to you. Has knowledge ceased? We are learning more in terms of knowledge. M knowledge is now multiplying you know, in, in the medical fields and scientific fields to the rate now they're saying like it doubles every so many years. It'll get down to doubling every 12 hours eventually at the rate we're going. So we, we all inherently know, like, no, we're, we're still learning. We're still knowing. We're still growing. We learn more about the ocean, learn more about the, the planets. We learn more about the physical body. You know, we have cures for disease today that, that did not exist 50 years ago. The knowledge is, so knowledge hasn't ceased. So, so why is it that the cessationist says, well, prophecies and tongues have, but knowledge is still here. So to be consistent, let's look at this and let's keep reading. What is Paul saying? When is he saying it will stop? He says this, he says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. 
So let me just say this to you. Anybody who ever prophesies to you words of wisdom, words of knowledge, spiritual gifts, healing, any of that, it is partial in nature. They don't know everything. Okay? Most of the time, they don't know anything. They're just telling you what God gave them to give to you and have no context for even what they're saying. This last Wednesday night, Pastor Wayne Drain was here and he ministered at the end of the service some prophetic words. He didn't know these people. I'm not in the back going, okay, this person, that person. So if you got a prophetic word, you could trust that the Lord spoke to him and that he's speaking to you. Now, you have the the right and responsibility to judge it and say, no, that doesn't bear witness with me because I have a gift of discernment. No, no, that's not me. You You got that one wrong. And the truth is that doesn't make him a false prophet. It just makes him human and wrong. A false prophet manipulates prophecy for their own good. Lord says, you should give me a new Rolex. That's a manipulation. Are y'all hearing me? And so the reality is, is that doesn't make them false. It just makes them wrong. Now, saying all that to say this, they know in part, they don't know at all. Why is that? Why doesn't God give them every detail? Well, I'd submit to you, it's because God doesn't want you leaning on them or even the prophetic word. He wants you leaning on him. You hear me? He wants you to come back to him and build that relationship with him. Lord, what are you saying to me? Lord, is this you? Lord, what do I need to do? What are you calling? Are y'all hearing me? And so God's all about relationship and those prophetic words are, are from the Lord. It's as the Lord sees you. It's not, it's not based on even time, right? Because God stands apart from time. So he might be speaking into 20 years from now. You hear what I'm saying? I receive words in my teenage years that speak to what I'm doing today. They weren't for when I was 19, they're for when I was 49. Y'all hear me? Do you, do you see me hesitate right there? Anyways, because 50's coming. Anyways, okay. But you hear what I'm saying? And so he says, they only know in part, they prophesy part. Now watch, when that which is perfect has come, the partial will pass away. So in context, he's saying prophecies end, knowledge end, um, tongues end, because right now it's all in partial. When we, when we all are imperfect, when the perfect comes, that will come away. Now, for the cessationists, they would say, well, this is, that's the word of God. The word of God is perfect. It is inspired. And I believe it is. I believe that. But I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. Let me, let me go on. He says this, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, when I matured, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, going back to the prophetic. He says, but then face to face. We will, now I know in part, but then I will know fully even as I've been fully known. Let me submit to you what I believe Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, spiritual gifts are for this life. You don't need them in eternity. When you are face to face, that phrase, face to face, when you stand face to face with Jesus, you won't need tongues. You won't need knowledge, why? Because he says it, you're going to know and be fully known. You will be transformed in an instant, supernaturally transformed into a spiritual body, still resembling yourself. It's still you, but you're transformed. That's the, that's the hope of our resurrection through Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. When you get to heaven, everybody always says this. Well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord. And let me tell you, you're not. You aren't. Because you won't need to. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord why he didn't make unicorns. Because I think unicorns are awesome. Right. You won't ask that question. Because you will know because you are transformed. Why? Well, how come you didn't answer that prayer, God? You'll know. You won't have to answer the question. You won't have to ask it. Well, how come that? How come you didn't smite them and you let them get away with it? You won't even have to ask the question because knowledge will cease because you'll know because you're transformed. That means those who have gone on into eternity with Christ, of of those of you sit in this room, they know what you're wrestling with, they're not wrestling with. That gives us hope. That's why we don't grieve like the world grieves, because we know they're transformed. So you don't need prophecy. Nobody's going to come to you, thus saith the Lord, because you're in the presence of the Lord. Be like, I'll just ask him myself, right? You don't need that anymore. You won't need prophecy. You won't need tongues. You won't need spiritual gifts, because there's no need to build you up, because you've been perfected, because you've entered into eternal paradise, into eternal rest, into eternity with Jesus Christ in the presence of God. Amen. And so Paul continues, and here I'm going to wrap it up. He says this. He goes on and says this. Now, now faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. Again, coming back to the the, the middle of of our spiritual gifting, the effectiveness is love. Verse 4, chapter 14. Pursue love. He reminds them again. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts. 
So in case you're wondering, is this from me? Paul tells you under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you should eagerly desire spiritual gifts. You need them. Every person in this room. He said, especially that you may prophesy. Why does he say this? Because again, Paul is trying to get them to focus on building each other up. For the one who speaks in tongues speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. By the way, that's capital S spirit, pneuma, which is the Holy Spirit. So what am I saying? People who speak in tongues, they say, well, I don't speak in tongues because I don't understand it. That's exactly the point. You know, I've, I've, I've led a number of people through the years uh, in, into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just, just conducting, not really doing anything except for just helping them. And, and they would say, well, I didn't understand it. I'm like, perfect, you're not supposed to. Why? Because the one who prays in tongues utters mysteries to God, not to men. Man doesn't understand it, only God understands it. It is a spirit, that's why I call it a spiritual language. It is a heavenly language that God gives you to pray. Why would God do such a thing? I mean, doesn't that seem strange? Why would God do something? Well, let's keep reading. He says, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their, for their, for their upbuilding, their encouragement, and their consolation. Just a side note, that's the definition of prophecy in the New Testament, for encouragement, for comfort, and for strengthening. That's what prophetic words are supposed to do for you. Amen? He says, and, and the one who speaks in a tongue, now here it is, the one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up. Did you see it? One of the reasons God gives you the spiritual language is so you build yourself up. So that your spiritual man is built up. You pray in the spirit, there's something of praying in the spirit that builds up your spiritual man, according to, according to Paul, according to the Holy Spirit. He says this, now I want you, listen to what Paul says, now I want you to sp- all to speak in tongues. Paul didn't say, I wish you all could speak in tongues. He says, I want you all to speak in tongues. I want every one of you to speak in tongues. All you Corinthians who love speaking in tongues, I want you all to speak in tongues, right? And so Paul is making this available. Like, I want you all to. I don't think Paul says this if it's not available because Paul would understand, like, I'm wanting something that's not God's will. And so he says, I want all of you to speak in tongues. He says, and he continues, he says, I want all of you to speak in tongues, but even more, I want you to prophesy. For the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone speaking in tongue interprets it so the church may be built up. All Paul is saying is this. He's not ranking the gifts in importance. What he's saying is the most important thing is to build up the church. That's what matters. It's not that you have some spiritual language and you're spiritually a spiritual giant. It's that you're building up the church. He says, oh, by the way, when you speak in tongues in a church gathering and it's interpreted, which he explains needs to happen later, he, he says this, when that happens, it actually, it actually acts the same as prophecy because the entire church is built up. Go ahead, go for it. I want you all to speak in tongues, but I want you to build each other up through prophetic words. Now, he, he begins to talk about the difference between what happens when I understand and don't understand. And I'm just gonna close with, with a few thoughts that, that Paul walks through. He says this in, in verse 12. He says, so, so with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. He says, the one who speaks in tongues should pray that he may interpret. Paul's talking again about public worship. He says this, for if I pray in tongues, listen, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? Paul says, what do I do? Do I just not do it? He says, no, no, no. Actually, what I do is I pray in the spirit and I pray with my mind. I sing my praise in the spirit, but I will also sing with my mind as well. So what is he saying? He's saying, listen, when I'm praying in the spirit, it's, it's not me praying, it's the spirit of God praying through my spirit. And so my mind is unfruitful. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I'm just praying. I might have a sense that God is doing something. I have a sense of God's you know, interceding, God's interceding through me, God, the spirit of God's interceding and, and, and all of that. But, but he says, I don't know what's going on. He goes, so what do you do? Do you just throw it away and don't do it? He said, no, no, no. I pray in the spirit and I pray with my mind. There are times when people come to me and pr- ask me to pray for them, I pray with my mind. Now there are some times I will pray in the spirit as well. But when I pray for them, I'm praying with my mind and I pray with my spirit. I pray, I sing with my mind, which is what you all did in worship today, because there's times though I sing in the spirit. He said, I, it's both. Are y'all seeing this? He says, it's both. And then he goes on and says this, verse 18, he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Now listen, we're talking to a Corinthian church that's consumed with speaking in tongues. 
And Paul says, you think you speak in tongues? I speak in tongues. What's he saying? Here's, here's what I want you to get. We're gonna wrap it up. Here's what I believe Paul's saying. In private, as much as you desire. Pray in the spirit as much as you desire. Paul says, I pray in tongues more than all of y'all. I want every one of y'all to pray in tongues. I want you to pray in your spiritual language. I pray in tongues all the time. I pray in, in the Holy Spirit, Paul says. He says, in private, I want you to pray as much as you desire. In, in public, with an interpretation. Paul literally gives some direction and he, and he says things like this. When you are gathered together and everybody wants to give a tongue, he says, let it be at most two or three of you with interpretation. So this is where some have gotten it confused. They think, well, the only time you're supposed to speak in tongues is when it's, when it's got an interpretation. And I would submit to you, I agree completely in a public setting. Because if someone starts speaking in tongues and nobody knows what they're saying, what good is it? That's what Paul says. What good is it? Unless it's interpreted so we can understand, right? Well, how's it interpreted? Well, there's actually a spiritual gift of interpretation that God gives somebody. And actually, Paul says, when you pray in tongues, you should interpret it. There's actually many times God will use the same person. Sometimes he'll use different people, but that's, God's, that's the Holy Spirit's choice to, to use whoever he chooses, right? And so Paul says this, in private, as much as you desire. In public, with an, with an interpreter. Two or three of you at most, with an interpretation, but eagerly desire to build up the church. Final verse, and Paul says this. Last verse of the chapter, he says this. So my dear brothers, again, he reminds them, earnestly desire to prophesy. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. Did you hear that? Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the inspired, infallible word of God says, do not forbid people to speak in tongues. I don't know what you do with that if, if you're a person who goes, I don't believe that. I'm like, well, you, you got a problem then. Because the Bible forbids that we forbid someone to speak in tongues. Clearly, we're clear on what the Bible's clear on. And so he says, he says do not forbid the speaking of tongues, but in all things should be done decently in order. You know, um, my experience in growing up, I grew up in the Bible Belt, um, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, so I'm not a bandwagon Kansas City Chiefs fan. I've, I've loved them forever, right? And so all y'all bandwagon people, welcome. Anyways, I'm a little bitter, but it's okay. But... I grew up in, in primarily uh, what you would call the Bible Belt. Now, there, the thing I love about Arizona is it's this sort of eclectic gathering of people from all over. Because a lot of people move here, retire here, move here for weather, you know, whatever reason. Um, and so you, you come from all different backgrounds. I mean, some people are like, oh, I'm, I'm from, it's not uncommon. And you understand this is different like in different parts of the country. Because there's certain parts of the country like, you know, if you live in Texas, like, you're like, bless God, I've been in Texas my whole life, bless God, right? You know, I got here as fast as I could, right? And so, like, there's places where people just, they just live their entire lives. Arizona's a little different because people come to Arizona. But my experience growing up in the Bible Belt was this. I, I faced a lot, even as a teenager, um, a lot of this idea that of the cessationism and, and it, it's just not for today, it's not for today, it's not for today. And um, like I said, went to a school that primarily taught this and, and a great place, loved Jesus, but just, just different sort of interpretation of scripture. And so what it did for me, I'm thankful for it because it actually forced me as a young man to really dig into the scripture and, get, and say, okay, God, what, what about it? What, what are you saying? Because I want to live, I want to live according to your word. And so the beauty of that, for years, every time I'd preach it, I would know that I was going to stand up in front of people who would come with their, their pat five arguments that they always use, and I would have to like, okay, I need to, I need to understand what you're saying, Lord, and agree where we can agree and disagree where we disagree. But here's one of the arguments that was always used consistently. They would skip over the <laughs> forbid not speaking in tongues. They wouldn't even mention that part. But they would go to the last line of the last verse and they would say, let everything be done decently in order. And they would use that verse and what they were relating it to was oftentimes the chaos and the craziness that would happen in Pentecostal charismatic circles. You ever been there? I mean, people just doing the wildest things and doing weird things. And you know, 
I really don't have a problem with weird people because weird is subjective. I've, I've mellowed over the years like, eh, you're different than me, that's okay, right? And the reality is what I found is this, if you are weird in your expression of the Holy Spirit, you're probably weird without it. You're probably just weird. Welcome to the weird family. You following me? And so for me, I don't get hung up on that stuff. There's, I, I've seen enough, like there's nothing you could do to shock me. I've seen, I've seen enough, there's nothing anybody's gonna do. I've heard enough prophetic words, like you can't shock me. And it doesn't mean I'm just like, everything is all good. I have the Holy Spirit in me that can help me discern and determine and discern what is the Lord and what is just flesh. Sometimes it's just people's response. They don't know how to respond. And that's why we're here to teach and equip the saints. So they walk in, not to make you not weird, because some people think you're weird for going to church on Sunday morning. Let's be honest. Some people are like, why would you get up and go sit in this place and listen to this guy talking to you about some weird language? Like, why would you even do that? Right? So let's talk about weird and how weird you are. And so I always thought that's kind of an interesting approach to just throw it out because you think it's weird. It's just not done in order. It's not decent. And I agree with that verse completely. It should be done decently and in order. It shouldn't be done in a way that, that ostracizes or embarrasses. Or, or, or. And again, I don't know that I can, I can promise your comfort in the presence of God. I don't know that that's my job. I'll be here with you in it. And I'll walk with you. And sometimes I'll scratch my head with you and be like, I don't understand that either. But, but man, let's just keep pressing into God and see what he says. Let's keep our heart open to God. But here's the thing. Not one time in making that very argument did anyone ever say to me, well, the Bible does say, let it be done. They focused on the decently in order. And I am for decently in order. I think you can look around this church and see that we are a, we are a leadership team staff that loves order. Excellence and structure and order but I love the presence of God as well. And I love the move of God. And I'm not intimidated by it. And so we want to let it be done. Are y'all hearing me? We want to let it be done. Let it be done. Decently in order. I want you to hear that. Lord, whatever you want to do, yeah, God will take us out of our comfort zones absolutely sometime. But that doesn't mean it's out of order. Are y'all hearing me? Well, pastor, what if it gets out? What if it gets crazy? Here's the beauty of that. This is why God puts spiritual leaders in the house to help lead it, to guide it, to coach it. Like, okay, hold on. Let's talk about that. And, and to help bring order to what's being done. Are y'all hearing me? So, here, two people I wanna talk to, we're gonna close. First group is this. Um, you have not discovered your spiritual gift. Uh, you, you don't know what your spiritual gift is. The statistic by Barna was put out, 87% of the church has no idea what their spiritual gift is. You know what that means? What if 87% of your body didn't know why it exists? Or 87% of the symphony didn't know their part? You go to the symphony and 87% of the, of the chairs up there just sit there with their instrument in hand, completely equipped to do something, don't know what to do. Amen? You, you would notice that you would notice that quickly. You're sitting here and you've never discovered your spiritual gift and we have something to help you. It's just a tool, it's a resource to help you. It's our Zion City Next, it's right after this service. When you leave, go straight across in every location out in the foyer, they'll have a room that can point you in the direction and there are people there that simply are there to help you learn and identify your spiritual gift. They don't tell you what it is because candidly, we're not the one who gives it. We don't know what it is. We just lay a grid and a framework out and say, okay, tell us about you. Tell us about your passions. Tell us about what's in your heart. Tell us about where you lean. Tell us about what, because what you're gonna find is this, is that gift is already probably at work on some level, but if you don't know what it is, you'll never sharpen and use it and exercise it. It will not become stronger. And so what I love is people come out of Zion City Next and they're always like, man, I've always loved this. And I'm like, duh, like, 
of course God made you that way and put this in you and you love it and you're fulfilled and it's not what you, you don't have to look like what you think. It's not like everybody's gonna start preaching next week. Listen, some might, but the reality is this, is that God shaped you and made you and put into you, woven to your giftings, your callings, your passion, your purpose. And if you're looking for purpose, let me tell you something, stop looking for it and start serving your way into purpose because you don't find purpose, you serve your way into purpose. People think they're just gonna find it like they find an Easter egg. That's not how it works. You serve and all of a sudden that purpose starts coming out. So you've never discovered it, you need to go to Zion City next. There's some of you sitting here, you've done that. You're like, yeah, pastor, I did that. And here's the problem is you know what it is, but you're not using it. I think that's probably a little bit, I don't wanna say worse, but man, now you're accountable for what you know. And so I wanna encourage you, find a place to use your gift. It's time to contribute. I'm calling you to contribute. I'm not talking about money. You can contribute money, great. Follow biblical principle, absolutely. But what is it that God has placed inside of you in terms of gifting that when you don't use it, we're missing it and you're missing us? What are we lacking? And you have it in your hands. What is the reason God brought you here to be a part of this body, this family? He said, I've got the perfect person for that. And he brought you here and you've yet to use that gift to bring a fulfillment to God's plan. So use it. What does that look like? Get involved in a ministry. If you have a passion and gifting for worship, get involved in worship. Production, get involved in production. Kids, youth, serving the homeless, serving the broken, city care. I mean, there's so much around you know, pastoring, leading groups. There's so many options for you to use that gift and grow it and develop it. You know, I know the challenge for some of you, you've been saved a long time and you know what I'm saying to you is true. You know it's how you grow. You know it's how you develop. And you're at a place in your life where like, yeah, pastor, I get all that. But here's my question to you. Who are the people that need you? Who are desperately looking for someone to help them by using your gift to teach them how to use their gift. Second group of people is this. I'm gonna talk to those of you who've never received a spiritual language, never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, never had an infilling, whatever you wanna call it. There's a number of things people will call it. Here's what I'm gonna say to you. I believe the gift of spiritual language of tongues is one of the most significant encounters with God that you can have subsequent to your salvation. Because I believe this, I pray in the Holy Spirit all the time. I pray in tongues. Listen, if you had to preach to you, you'd pray in tongues too. (laughs) Why? Because I need my spiritual man built up. I want my spiritual man strong. I wanna be able to withstand the the, the the temptation, the trial, the struggle, the pain. I I wanna be able to stand firm. I wanna deepen my faith. I want my spiritual man strong. Some of you spend hours and hours at the physical gym. It's time to spend some time in the spiritual gym of praying in the spirit building up your spiritual man. Yeah, but you can't see that, pastor. I know, but I'll tell you something. You'll know when it's built up and when it's not. And here's what we're gonna do. I was praying about this. I said, Lord, this is a lot, three chapters. He said, we'll make it two parts. And I said, okay, well, I can do that. But here's what we're doing. Wednesday night in prayer. I wanna encourage you to come out. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, you wanna be baptized in the Holy Spirit, come out. On Wednesday night, we're gonna pray for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, their spiritual language. If you're a person who, who, it's been a long time since I've prayed my spiritual language, come out Wednesday night. Now, here's what I know. Well, okay, great, Wednesday night, I'll wait till then. No, you don't wait. You start praying right now. Jesus, fill me. Holy Spirit, show me anything I need to see. Prepare my heart. Maybe even a little fasting. I know it's crazy. Just, just, just pursuing God, just saying, Lord, I want everything that you have for me. I'm showing up Wednesday in faith, expecting God, you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. For some of you, you won't make it till Wednesday because he'll fill you on Monday. It's been my experience. I'm telling you. Because he's a good father who loves to give the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, to those who ask him. Are you hearing me? And so Wednesday night, we're gonna just take our prayer service, our gathering, and we're gonna focus on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want you to come. If you're already filled with the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues, come as well. Help us create an environment of expectation for what God wants to do. Amen? Come on, can we stand up together?